do. Okay. And then let me enter some of these people. Okay. Very exciting. Going well. There's still plenty of time for things to stop going well, but for right no, now. No, don't go there, Sarah. We're going to be fine. We're going to be fine. I, I've been doing this class oh, for months now. It's all good. That's true. You're a pro. You had to do all the pro, everything on Zoom for the we, classes we, and everything. We did. We did. I'll be doing it again in the fall, and that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Wow, that's crazy. Okay. Well, we're a little early, and that's also the opposite of I say, well, that, That's not Newman Center. No, no I know. No. We should be 15 minutes yeah, late minutes usually. Late. At least. I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, we like, a few well, like, people viewing on Facebook Live as well. But my guess is that we'll see them uh, uh, drifting in at Newman Center time, and that's all good. Oh yeah, that's 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 true to us. So that's good. That so good. hi everyone. More people are entering in. I just want to let everybody know. Also, um, this is also being shown on Facebook Live. And if you know anyone who's watching on Facebook Live, and for the people who are on Facebook Live, there's about a 20 second delay between when we're talking and when Nelly will be talking. So any questions that you'll have towards the end after Professor Drew gives her lecture. It might take just a little bit of time, 20 seconds or so for you to get caught up with us in real time because there is a bit of a lag for the live stream. But welcome everyone. We're so glad we were still able to offer all of this uh, virtually, you know, everything going on. We'll wait a few more minutes because like we said, Newman time is a little bit later. We don't wanna rush our parishioners. <laughs> We're just going to wait a few more minutes for those of you who are just joining us. Uh, going to be a little prompt, which is early for Newman time, like we were saying, but always good to start something new. Oh, good. More people are joining on the live. So once again, and I'll maybe say this a couple times as people join in, if you're viewing this on Facebook Live, welcome. Um, there's a bit of a lag for the streaming, for the live streaming part of this. So Facebook Live, you're about 20 seconds behind us. So at the end of the session, after Nelly gives her lecture, there'll be an open Q&A. Feel free to type out any questions you have to us. We'll just wait, there's a little bit of a lag for that 20 second delay. And then if you're joining us on Zoom here, um, at the end, if you wanna unmute yourself and ask a question, you're more than welcome. People might be unmuting themselves at the same time. So we'll just, you know, navigate that. But if you also want at the bottom, um, there's a, a dashboard with everything. There's a chat button and I'll be making sure to check the chat as well for the, any questions you have to ask. All right. And it's seven. Father Pat says he couldn't get on Zoom. So thanks to Sarah got on Facebook, so Father Pat's here as well. <laughs> it's just on Facebook. <laughs> well, it is seven, 701. So I think we're gonna start. Like I said, we're just gonna be a little bit different. Not gonna be too late. Um, we're all here, so why not? So thank you everybody who's tuning in and joining us for our first virtual bridge lecture series. Very exciting. 
um, with everything going on for the pandemic, we didn't, we couldn't be able to offer it in person like we usually were, but a few parishioners reached out and said, you know, is there possible we could still do it online and stuff? And luckily Nellie here was willing to offer it online for us too. We're trying to get a few more people in for the summer, kind of hard. Everybody's all over the place with this pandemic, but we're so excited for our first session to have Professor Nellie Drew here to talk about um, the return to play, the impact on how the pandemic is affecting major sports teams. Um, which is really interesting and relevant right now, especially as it starts to get closer to fall and a couple sports, you know, organizations are starting to get back into it. So that'll be really interesting to hear. A little background about Nellie. Uh, she's a professor at the UB Law School and she's the director for sports advancement. No, maybe not. Close. Sports. Close. Close. <laughs> the Center for the Advancement of Sport. Center for the Advancement of Sport. Thank you. And um, she did a talk actually a few years ago for our Bridge Lecture Series. And you know what? She liked us so much that she became a parishioner. So we're lucky and blessed to have her not only in the UB realm of the law school, but also as a parishioner with us at the Newman Center. So without further ado, Nellie, you could take on over. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, first, let me say how much we miss everybody. Uh, we, we very much enjoy uh, watching Mass uh, uh, on Facebook, but it's certainly not the same thing as being with everybody in person. So we, when I say we, I mean me, my, my husband, Paul, and our kids, we, we all very much look forward to the day when we can do this in person again, um, and not just a bridge lecture series. Um, so thank you for the invitation. Um, this has been a very interesting year in my career, certainly. It's nothing like this has ever happened before, and we certainly hope it doesn't again. Uh, when this first occurred in March, and I teach sports law, and all I could think was, what am I going to talk about in my classes for the next couple of months and keep these young people out of trouble? And it turned out that there was an awful lot of sports involved in, in what was going on with the pandemic. There were so many, many issues because, of course, you know, as, as lawyers, sports lawyers, we, we live and breathe by rules and, and, and contracts and agreements. And certainly there was no way anybody could have anticipated this. And so we had all sorts of interesting legal issues crop up. And so now we're seeing the professional sports leagues wrestle with these issues uh, and it's happening on, on a daily basis, different things are occurring. So just to give you some sense of where we are, and there's a gentleman who said he, 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 went, he wanted to go back to play, but under certain circumstances, I thought what I would do is I'd walk you through where each of the potential, each of the sports leagues is at the moment and what specific concerns uh, each of them are encountering um, as they, they work through the hurdles to getting back to play. And in particular, um, we have very detailed information because the NFL made their protocols uh, available. Uh, so I can walk you through those in, in, in more specifics uh, and kind of give you some insight as to the concerns that each of the leagues and of course the players associations have because they're a large part of this. So the NBA, of course, uh, as many of you may know, decided they were going to go into a bubble. And originally this sounded like a really, really good idea. Uh, because they were going to be able to sequester all of the teams that qualified for the playoffs. And as you may recall, it was a, it was a big deal, right? And this is probably for many of us, the first indication we had that something was really, really wrong. And that was when uh, the Utah Jazz were playing a game uh, or about to play a game and, and the uh, referee ran the court and stopped it because a player tested positive. And so they were very sensitive to the, to the, high profile aspect of this. And they thought this all out very carefully. And it's a brilliant idea that since Walt Disney World was wide open, perhaps they would go down there and use their facilities and create sort of the perfect bubble. So the timeline has been in place for a while now. And it's actually this week, as of July 7th, uh, the teams are supposed to arrive down there with training camp and scrimmages to begin shortly thereafter. And then the season is actually supposed to start to start back up again in July 30th with, with seating games to take place. And then the play-in games would be somewhere in the middle of August. The playoffs start August 17th. And then as you can see there on the screen, the semis and the finals you know, follow in, in due, due time. Uh, the finals going in from September to October. But of course, you know, as this, this timeline was arrived at, I'm gonna say about 
month and a half ago. And we all know it's been going on in Florida more recently. So maybe, so, so now in retrospect, perhaps this wasn't, wasn't the best plan. Then we have Major League Baseball. And Major League Baseball, of course, was in a different uh, uh, spot because their season had yet to begin. So very different uh, um, and yet similar uh, concerns with respect to whether or not Major League, whether or not and how Major League Baseball was to start up. And initially they looked like they had the best handle on things. As, as recently as the beginning of June, it seemed as if they thought they were going to be able to reach an agreement with the players on pretty much everything and be able to bring baseball back. But of course, there's been some additional issues. And as, we, as you, you may or may not know, um, they still have not uh, come to agreement on, on specific uh, pieces of the return to play. So they, they're expecting a truncated season, 60, 60 games in about 66 days. The players arrived back today. They went back to their home parks because various uh, um, of the spring training facilities in, in Arizona and Florida had to be shut down due to positive COVID cases. Opening day is now anticipated to be on July 23rd. And the biggest single change they made, although they're allowing teams to play from their home fields, is to limit travel within a team's own division or the regional division, the corresponding regional division of the uh, uh, other league in the same geographic area. So again, I attempt to try to not necessarily have a bubble, but to at least draw a bit of a circle around where their competitions are going to be held. 60 games, as I said, each team's going to have a designated hitter, including the National League. And uh, this, this manual is of great interest to me because one of my former students actually is involved in drafting it, one of the architects of it. John Coyles, who's a 2010, I believe, graduate of UB Law, now is the vice president of drug health and safety programs for Major League Baseball. And he and I have been corresponding by email back and forth. Uh, I haven't heard as much from him recently. I suspect he's quite busy. Uh, but that's, that manual started out at 64 pages. And then the NFL or NA, uh, MLBPA got its hands on it and expanded to 100 pages. And this is what happens when you put lots of lawyers in a room, right? Um, so, so it became uh, it's become quite quite the uh, uh, interesting uh, um, diary, shall we say? Um, and and well, we'll get there. We'll talk a little bit more about when we talk about the NFL one. The player pool they're going to have is going to be expanded because minor leagues have been shut down, as you may know. As of today, it was, I believe it was announced that minor league season is officially canceled, although some smaller leagues had, had canceled prior to this. So they're starting with a roster pool of about 60 players because there's anticipation that there will be some positive tests and, of course, injuries and the like. And by day 29, halfway through the season or thereabouts, they're going to have that roster down to 26. And so far, we know at least four players, the four I've listed on the screen there, who have said that they definitely will not be returning to play and they're expecting more to do the same. And as I, as I mentioned there, as my last bullet point there, what remains to be seen is what the impact of this will be on the di ongoing dispute between minor league and major league baseball. Uh, as you may know, there was a great furor this past winter over the potential for major league baseball to shut down as many as 42 uh, minor league baseball teams across the country, including my, my own uh, favorite team in Batavia, the Muck Dogs, which I, I grew up watching single A ball in a there is no finer sport in my book, but in any event, um, a great deal of, of um, uh, fear, a great deal of, of um, concern at the minor league baseball level um, as to what happened, what would happen, even this was even before COVID. So we'll, we'll see where this goes from there. And then the NHL, uh, the NHL decided to sort of mimic New York State and, and put in what they call a four phase return to play. Uh, phase one is quarantine, which we've all been through. Phase two began June 8th with voluntary workouts for players at club facilities, but they were limited to six players in group. Phase three is going to begin next week on uh, July 10th with 24 playoff teams. And yes, we know who didn't make it by half a point uh, beginning training camp. We're not going to go into that because I, I, I look at vastly off track and that would not be a good thing. Um, and then, of course, phase four would return to play in late July and early August. Now, the, the big caveat here, as much as we've said with respect to Major League Baseball, um, a player vote is going to be required for this to take place. And that player vote is supposed to occur later this week. Uh, interestingly, and I think uh, with a good deal of, of foresight here, the NHL has decided that in order to uh, create a situation of financial stability as much as possible, and of the four leagues, I would say arguably the NHL has the franchises that are most likely to be threatened. By, by the pandemic. Uh, they are extending the collective bargaining agreement by an additional two to three years, or at least that's what's in play here, uh, as in an attempt to provide for some sort of cost certainty for the franchises going forward, which I think is a 
very bright idea. Now, it remains to be seen, you know, uh, to what extent they'll be able to, to get this passed, but it, it appears at least to date anyhow, the NHLPA and the NHL have been working very closely together uh, without a whole lot of um, public uh, uh, discussion, which is unusual. So, so fingers crossed, but it sounds like that might be a really good idea. They were the ones who pioneered the hub city concept that you may have heard about. So initially there are as many as I think six or seven uh, uh, cities in play. And of course, everybody kind of hoped the Buffalo would be one of them. Um, ultimately it came down to just a handful. And interestingly enough, um, there was uh, some, there were some, there were some uh, curves, shall we say, that I, curve balls that the NHL I don't think anticipated. They initially wanted to have one city in the US and one in Canada serve as a hub city. And the idea was much like the bubble situation, you'd have at least uh, uh, one uh, home arena, but with multiple uh, side ice pads that additional games could be played on, obviously no fans, um, in a complex that would be large enough to accommodate all of the, you know, all the players and, and support personnel that would be there. And as you can see there, they were talking about 50 personnel that would be allowed for each of the 24 playoff eligible teams. Well, Vegas, until very recently, was one of the spots that they anticipated having a hub city. But of course, as we all know, the Vegas COVID numbers went sky high and the NHL uh, was smart to decide that, that was not a really good idea. So Vegas dropped off the table. At the same time, Vancouver was very much in the running. But um, and perhaps this is due to you know, a different government, governing structure in, in, um, in Canada. Um, the uh, health officials in, in British Columbia were not comfortable with what the NHL's protocol was going to be in the event that there were positive COVID tests. And the point at which the NHL was going to be interested or, or, or would consider, I should say, uh, yanking uh, um, you know, either the entire tournament or a team from the tournament in the event of positive COVID tests. So Vancouver said, thank you, but no thank you, and withdrew. So that's kind of interesting. And ultimately, uh, we found out today that the Eastern Conference is headed to Toronto and the Western Conference is headed to Edmonton. So they're staying out of the U.S. entirely. Now, the concern that raises is that Canada has this very, very lovely 14-day quarantine going on for anybody who crosses the border. I don't know if anybody here has tried to do that recently, um, but unless you have a relative in Canada, it's going to be immediate family relative. It's going to be rather difficult. Um, because it's Canada, because it's the NHL, guess what? The NHL players are getting a relief, a waiver from the 14-day quarantine. I would argue that's probably the, those are probably the only people uh, um, that would ever be able to get that. And of course they did. Hey, what's, you know, what's, what's Canada out hockey, right? Um, interestingly also though, players who played elsewhere during this pause will be ineligible. So there were a handful of players that went back and played in the Russian Continental League and they will not be eligible to play. Um, the NHL has also indicated that they're very concerned for the mental health of their players. So they're going to have what they're calling resort districts within the bubbles. Um, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. They're talking about op owning and operating their own restaurants in Toronto near the Rogers Center. So uh, we'll see how that goes, right? So what are the pros of this discussion so far, right? Um, we all want sports, right? I want sports. I'm bored. I'm, you know, there's, I love watching May Day for the, you know, the, second and third and fourth times, that was all great, but you know, live sports would be phenomenal. And, and certainly I, I know I'm not alone because you're on here with me, right? Um, but this captive international audiences would be a really great thing. And I know that baseball in particular was salivating at the idea of being the only sport out there for consumption for a period of time, which of course they end up losing the jump on that. Certainly you have this unique, intense, concentrated postseason atmosphere in particular for the NBA and the NHL. Uh, money, right? Um, and the NBA has, has you know, indicated that they've got somewhere in the neighborhood of $900 million worth of television revenues that are currently at stake. And that's not small potatoes for anybody, including Mark Cuban. Um, goodwill with sponsors, when you think about it. Um, so when you talk about how books are handled for professional sports franchises, you sell those sponsorship deals for years in advance. So to the extent that you're carrying something on your books that you have not been able to, to discharge, a liability you've not been able to discharge in terms of, you know, everything from, you know, uh, uh, oh, the board ads to, to, you know, any kind of uh, event in the arena or whatever, the extent you can discharge some of that, that's a really good thing. And finally, of course, MLB has not yet relinquished the idea of having some gate, some attendance at, at various facilities at a certain point in the season. So what are the cons? Well, this is, I guess, where the lawyers come in, right? Um, labor issues. Uh, you have players and coaches who may not want to go. 
Um, in the NBA parlance, they're being called protected or they may, might be called excused. Uh, of the four leagues, the NBA is the only one I've seen so far, which has actually taken the position that they will take the initiative and themselves, the league will excuse play, uh, players or coaches or other staff members that they feel uh, would pose, would, would be an excess, risk, uh, an excess risk if they were to be there. Um, and, and by the way, those, those people would be paid. In Major League Baseball, you have what they're, they're deeming high-risk individuals. Uh, those individuals can elect not to play, and they'll be paid. But if they have a person like they have in their family, they will not be paid. So there's a little bit of a kind of a give and go there. Uh, certainly, the capacity and the effectiveness of testing is a major concern. Um, baseball, I believe, is going to do it on every other day. The NBA is indicated doing it on a daily basis. Um, we'll see what the, what the NHL does. Um, compliance issues, certainly. And by that, I mean, you know, uh, one of the biggest questions about Major League Baseball is that each team is supposed to be creating its own sort of off the field code of conduct and everyone's going to have like an honor code. So they're expecting the players to, you know, display good, good common sense, not go to you know, crowded bars, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but certainly there's a concern there, right? Um, integrity of the game concerns. Is it a real championship? You know, if if um, you know a, a team has to has to withdraw because of a variety of, of reasons, including you know a majority of its players having COVID, um, is it a real Major League Baseball season? You only got sixty games. Um, certainly, those are those are things to to, to worry about. Uh, protecting the bubble or the hub, um, the NHL is indicated they're actually going to build a wall around um, the uh, Rogers Arena in in uh, Edmonton. This will be interesting to see. Um, down at Disney World, it's going to be a little more challenging, and uh, there's a concern there. What would you know? What's the liability if the hub or the bubble is not adequately protected by security? And something we'll talk about more a little bit later on is the potential for disaster. Do you really want to be the league that has that biological bomb happen? Um, and maybe, maybe not. And the big one from my perspective, of course, again, the legal side is liability, and there's no way you're going to get insurance to cover it at this point. And as you may know, there have already been a number of lawsuits uh, to, to determine whether or not uh, business disruption insurance would apply in, in, in various contexts in the sporting industry in particular. So the NFL, of course, is the luxury of backhand because they don't have to play for a while. Everybody watched the, the draft on, you know, on, on TV from Rogers, Rogers Man Cave. That was highly entertaining, wasn't it? Um, and we all like to get back there, certainly very much so. So they're looking at a different year. Uh, as of June 5th, coaches were allowed back into facilities. As of July 28th, training camps will open and rookies and other, other players can return a little bit earlier, but they're going to return to a different scenario. Locker rooms are going to be reconfigured. Players are going to have to wear masks when they're not working out. And what's interesting, of course, you see the Arizona governor's face right there, is the very different perspective we're seeing play out across the country on whether or not there should be fannies and seats. And uh, Arizona still, uh, last words of Dr. Uh, Governor Ducey were absolutely. So we'll see. So the NFL and the NFLPA have come up with this facility protocol, which as I said, they've made available. And it's, it's very, very detailed. And I'll give you some highlights here. Each club is responsible for producing two of these infectious disease emergency response plans. And they, both, they have two models, one for more than 20 players present in the facility, one for less. And they have drawn lines around certain areas. So in certain restricted areas, which as you can imagine, the locker room, uh, the, the field, uh, that type of thing, uh, strength and conditioning rooms are limited to essential personnel. They have broken up into three specific tiers. The first tier being players and people who have to be uh, in actual physical contact with them with direct access, uh, like, like team doctors and the like. The second tier would be other essential personnel who need close proximity to the players. And the third tier are essential employees to the team who don't need to have that same contact. So the teams each have to submit a list of each of these three tiers to the NFL seven days before the players report for league approval. There are limitations as you can see in the screen. So in essence, you're talking no more than 105 people per team in the facility and they're gonna stagger time so not all there at once. They also went so far as to prohibit contact among the tiers. So all of the, the leagues, uh, um, uh, regulations, this seems to be the most uh, uh, draconian, if you will, most uh, um, exacting. Tier two and tier three personnel are specifically pro prohibited from interacting with players and other people in that tier. And tier two personnel, uh, again, support personnel, are required to wear PPE and minimize the time they're spending in restricted areas, again, staying away from tier one on the field, off the field, in the community, whatever. So very, very specific requirements here. 
there are going to be some facility alterations. And of course, it remains to be seen who's going to be paying for that, particularly in a place like you know, Buffalo, where New Era is county owned, right? Uh, you're going to have to have separate entrances for tier one and tier two personnel. Um, these entrances have to be automated or no touch entrances and exits. You have to have restricted areas clearly marked with signage. There's been mention of security uh, and personnel by, the, by them as well. And the interesting part is you're going to have six foot space for social distancing in locker rooms. And some locker rooms may not accommodate that. So there may have to be some reconfiguration of facility uh, um, accommodations to allow for that. They're going to do daily COVID testing of all tier one, two personnel before they enter the facility. So you're going to have to have a separate space outside the facility to, to allow for that to happen. They're going to be limiting strength and conditioning workouts to no more than 15 people at a time, which to my mind still sounds like a fair number. Meetings have to be done virtually. And if they can't be done virtually, they have to be done in a socially distant manner with masks on. And take a look at this. This is all the stuff that they have to do before the players return. Deep cleaning, 48 hours beforehand. And then as we get into the, you know, sort of the nitty gritty, high touch common areas have to be cleaned three times a day. They specifically advise the teams you better have both a nighttime cleaning crew and a daytime cleaning crew to keep up with the schedule. Um, other services, you know, disinfected once a day. Uh, two weeks supply of, of this type of thing at all times. They're measuring the CO2 levels to make sure the ventilation inside the facilities is adequate. And you know the idea of cleaning players' pads after every use is just amazing to me. But this is, I mean, this is the detail that they're getting into. And the last one I found very interesting, personal items like everyone's cell phone. So those 105 people who walk into the facility, everybody has to hand over their, their keys, their cell phone, et cetera, to be cleaned as they enter. So just a phenomenal amount of detail. People are being very, very careful here. Player food service, which is always a big thing, right, for, for, the, uh, for the NFL. They have to have a protocol for distribution of meals and supplements and medications. They're going to limit access to the meal room to tier one, tier two, and with staggered meal time, so they're not eating in a group. One kitchen or caterer. And I found that specifically interesting because Major League ba or excuse me, um, the NBA is allowing uh, the players to uh, order in from certain restaurants in the Orlando area, and they're going to have various other restaurant foods delivered to them. So, very different perspective. And I know we, we've all probably heard the dialogue out there as to whether or not you can actually contract COVID from you know takeout meals and the like. So, uh, the, the NFL is taking the position: one kitchen, one caterer. Pre-made meals and disposable containers, no buffets, not even a coffee, you know, coffee machine, um, obviously PPE, and they're going to disinfect the meal room every time somebody uses it. PPE, again, everybody's got to wear it. And uh, now that, that, that kind of, I got to wonder about that one. Everyone must wear masks unless it interferes with the performance of athletic activities. So I had a conversation with a friend who's an athletic director oh, about, I don't know, three or four weeks ago. And I said to him, you know, what do you think about football coming back? And he said, is a sport, the purpose of which seems to be the sharing of bodily fluids. <laughs> what do you do with that? So I kind of wonder when I see, you know, that, that, that sort of language, unless it interferes with the performance of athletic activities, hmm, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, uh, gonna, I, I don't know, great question. Uh, gloves are gonna be required for everybody, hand sanitizing stations everywhere. And again, they have to have a two week supply of PPE to open. So what happens? All these rules, because this again, it's a, that's a fairly large uh, piece of, uh, you know, fairly large document. What happens if and when people don't abide by that? So the NFL and the NFLPA have jointly agreed that they're going to be responsible for compliance. It's not just on the league. It's not just on the clubs. They're going to have unannounced inspections, kind of like OSHA inspections. Uh, club personnel are specifically, you know, obligated to report violations. And there are going to be monthly certifications by the head team doctor and an NFL infection control officer. Now, we've never seen this before, so I can't even begin to guess to what, if any extent, there may be liability there if somebody, for example, a team doctor, is aware that every letter of these restrictions is not being abided by by a team. I don't know. But anytime, I do know this, anytime you have rules, standards of conduct or whatever, that has the force of you know, creating a responsibility, an obligation that you must discharge. And if you don't do it properly, then there's the specter of liability. Now, the, the one caveat I should mention is that causation is going to be difficult to prove, right? Who knows if you pick up COVID, you know, in the locker room, on the way home, uh, it, again, Major League Baseball in particular, where we really don't know what might be happening when these players are, are, not, are not even in a bubble to begin with. But, but certainly the, the perception, the public perception is, is, is of a great concern as it always is in sports. 
The NFLPA also took the step of requiring agents to contact their players. They sent a very direct message to the agents, the contract advisors, saying, you need to get in touch with each of your players and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them, advising them about all the risk factors from the CDC and requiring them to meet with their personal doctors before they make the choice as to whether or not they want to participate in the season. They don't mention anything about a waiver, but they do make this, this direct statement. And I had this conversation with my daughters yesterday and she was like, what NFL lineman isn't at risk, right? Um, and then there's a there's a there's a concern, and of course, also in, in the piece that's kind of flying under the radar a little bit here, is that certainly on both the NFL and the NBA, you have a large proportion of, of minority players, and that is, of course, as we all know, a segment of the population that's been particularly hard hit by COVID and may very well have at-risk family members. So there's a, a larger discussion here that none of these protocols have touched upon, but it's certainly part of the of the background. So should they return? Um, there you go, I don't know. It's an ethical and a moral dilemma as well as a legal one, right? Uh, certainly as counsel, you can always provide information about relative risks, potential liability. You know, there's a risk benefit calculation going on there. Um, what I'd be most afraid of is the biological bomb. And that happened, it actually happened. And I give you a picture here. Uh, February 19th this year, well before you know we had it here, but certainly as it was percolating through Europe, we had game zero as it's being called now. It was two days before the first positive case occurred in Italy. It was a Champions League match that was very highly anticipated between Atalanta and Valencia, and it was a disaster. Um, in hindsight, the Bergamo mayor came out with this statement. We were mid-February, so we didn't have the circumstances of what was happening. If it's true what they're saying, the virus was already circulating in Europe in January, which is we now know is true, then it's very probable that 40,000 Bergamashi in the stands of San Siro altogether exchanged the virus between them. And it is possible that so many group Bergamashi that night got together in houses, bars to watch the match and did the same. Unfortunately, we couldn't have known. No one knew the virus was already here. It was inevitable. Now there's a big difference now because of course we do know. So in legal language, it's foreseeable, which means you've got an obligation to try to prevent that from happening. So you fast forward to June this year and Major League Baseball again had to shut down all their training camp facilities in both Arizona and, and Florida due to COVID as of June 19th. The Nuggets ended up closing their facility this week after they had a couple of positive tests. The Pelicans have three people who are positive so far. And you can see the numbers there. 16 out of 302 NBA players have been tested positive. The NFL, NHL, excuse me, so far is reporting 26 out of 20, 250. I would argue the question isn't you know whether, but when, right? It's almost inevitable. So what's the risk versus the reward? Um, love that quote from Adam Silver. I, I think the role of Adam, Adam Silver I think is a really good job um, na navigating some very difficult waters. Uh, I hope he means it when he says that. Um, but you know, I, if it's not all just about the money, then then what's driving this? So uh, that's my song dance. I'd be interested to hear what you think. It's a dialogue, not a not not a given for sure at this point in time. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. I wish we had like a sound effect machine for clapping and everything. We'll all just jazz hand or something. Yeah. Um, so we're going to open up for questions now. Oh, we got a thumbs up from someone. I liked that. <laughs> um, so if you feel comfortable on muting yourself, if you're on Zoom, also feel free if you're on Facebook Live to type out a question or also um, if you're on Zoom, you can um, chat a question. Um, I have a question, so I'll just start. So have you heard anything about at the college level for sports? I know there's a ton of parishioners at the Newman Center who, you know, basketball for Father Pat, I know, um, football or football team and everything. What are they doing at the college level to put in, are, are we having sports at the college level? And then what are the, if you know, what are they putting in place to safeguard at the college level? Yeah, that's a tough one. As I'm, as I'm saying this, I'm looking right at Ron Balter, who's the number one UB fan. <laughs> uh, Ron, we're gonna have a rough year, I think. Um, it depends. So, so um, Notre Dame, for example, I mean, I've got kids in college, right? So I'm getting, hearing this dialogue for a variety of different, different um, dimensions. Uh, Notre Dame said they're coming back on campus. They're gonna try to beat the virus. Um, their coach came out and said, if we can't have our students on campus, we can't have our players uh, in the facility. So, um, which I, you know, I, I think that's a, a 
responsible way of approaching it. I'm not sure in practice it's going to work out that well. Um, I think it's going to be highly uh, location specific. And, you know, talking to some of my colleagues in athletic departments, what we're anticipating is that there may need to be some flexibility in scheduling events. Um, it may be that, you know, UB, for example, may not go to Eastern Michigan, but they might be okay going somewhere else, you know, um, which is challenging because these contracts, you know, for, for games, you know, not just conference games, other games are, are, are set out way in advance um, and, and gives lawyers, you know, hives when you start messing with, with documents. But um, more likely than not, there's going to have to be a lot of flexibility built in. We got a question from Facebook Live from Joe LaGiacono. He said, suites in NFL stadiums are leased. So does the league still control exit and entry? <laughs> Great question. Well, the facility controls that, but the facility is subject to county or local health, you know, health re uh, requirements, right? So in our case, you know, uh, New Era Field, um, you're going to have to abide by whatever the county health commissioner decides is appropriate. I have a question. Sure. The NHL, there's been talk for years of, requ of requiring the players in the NHL to wear full visors rather than just a half visor or nothing. Has there been any talk to amending the CBA to require that for everybody? There's a full visor with help stop the spread of the of the vapors that would that pass COVID. That's a great idea, Ron. Um, I, you know, I wanted that myself. I, I don't know if you saw that Jack Eichel uh, was working with, a, was a Bauer to produce those face shields that struck me at the time. Why not, right? Um, the players don't like them because they claim that they fog up. I've got to believe there's a way, you know, somebody in engineering here should be able to figure out a way to keep that from happening. Um, but I will tell you that based on my experience many years ago, and now I'm dating myself, uh, when we worked on getting players to wear helmets on the ice, which I know for the younger people, it's like, what? Yes, they, they played without helmets. Um, they were brutal. So, you know, maybe the younger generation's a little more accepting, but I would bet you you'd have a really, really difficult time getting the NHLPA to agree to that. Although I agree, I think it makes tons of sense. Father Pat says, that's why coming back to church is also is also an ethical challenge, especially in light of surges occurring after opening up. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, I mean, that's the problem, right? Nobody wants to be that one team or that one league that has that happen. And, you know, again, Vancouver's point to the NHL was, well, we're not comfortable with what your emergency plan is in the event something happens. And, um, you know, uh, Honestly, I, I, I kind of wonder a bit about, that's Florida, but I wonder a bit about Florida right now because I have, maybe somebody else knows, I, I haven't seen yet today what their you know ICU, their hospitalization rate is at the moment, but you have to wonder about bringing all those extra people down there and overtaxing and already you know challenged medical system, uh, similarly with Arizona. Um, so, so you know how does that play into it? I don't, I don't know, but that, that's a concern for sure. No, absolutely. I didn't even consider the increase in population with the different, you know, bringing teams and those are big teams. And, you know, if you're in a state where it's already, I know Arizona with their hospitalization rate is super high. So that's an interesting point. Yeah. So, so my husband observed to me tonight that, you know, if it goes well, the Toronto mayor, mayor is going to be a hero. If it goes badly, he's going to be a goat. Um, because Canada done a remarkably good job locking down uh, um, COVID. And in fact, so, so many of you may know uh, Jerry Meehan, who's my, my good friend and colleague, and Jerry got stranded up there at his house in Toronto before the, as this was occurring. And uh, we had a conversation this morning where he was telling me that a friend's daughter had returned to a Canadian cottage, um, her parents own over there from the US, and she was being tra trailed by government somebody from the government for 14 days because she's supposed to self-quarantine. So keeping track of where she went. All right, we got in the chat, Thomas Palmer. 
Oh, if this is being recorded, where can I tell others they can watch it? It will be up on our um, YouTube page later on tonight. Um, so that's UB Newman is our account for the YouTube page. Um, it will also be up with Facebook Live. You could rewatch a recording. So it'll also be up on our Facebook page, which is also UB Newman. And then oh, Ryan Mulcahy, that's my fiance. <laughs> Players are generally held to assume the risk of being injured on the field. In your opinion, would this extend to contracting COVID on the field? Oh, He's a law student. <laughs> yeah, I may actually ditch this one off to Ron because he does the workers' comp. Um, Ron, what are you thinking? Well, about a year and a half ago, I would have said yes because I was representing injured workers, now <laughs> representing em employers and insurance companies. I think the way the courts in New York, in New York at least, have ruled is that the hazard isn't being, isn't there from the job. The hazard is from the coworker, which is where prop, most of the athletes would probably get it. So a, in New York, there's a good likelihood that unless the legislature acts, that these people will not be entitled to compensation benefits. Um, I can tell you from, from my practice, people who are working in the healthcare industry who are exposed to patients with it, those cases are being accepted. But other industries where people are, you don't know where, they're, where they were exposed to it. If it's, you're exposed to it in the office, yeah. the hazard is the coworker, not the job. If you're a delivery person, you know, if you like, if you work in a supermarket, did you get it from somebody in the supermarket or did you get it on the street from some place, you know, passing somebody? Did you get it from a family member? Who has it? So there are lots of issues of causation. The players may try for compensation. There are advantages to the, if the clubs accept it as compensation, because if it turns out it's not compensation, can they can sue it. the club. They can sue the team because, well, I got it because you were negligent in how this was set yeah. up, despite all the protocols. And since I lost my compensation case, now I get to sue you for damages, which can be a lot more money. So there are a whole bunch of factors involved in where the case ends up. Yeah, and that causation piece too, I imagine would be, would be affected by um, what, the, what the parameters were. So for example, if it happened in the Walt Disney World bubble, it's a lot easier to point the finger at the NBA than if it happens to a major league baseball player who's out in the community more, right? Right. And also like, you know, in, that, in New York, you know, the people who are traveling to and from work, did you get it, you know, are you getting it because of part of your job? Would you get it because some guy, some guy on the subway who didn't wear a mask before it was required? So there are all sorts of issues on causation, which you know will be a, you know a logistical nightmare for a lot of people to try and win their claims. Yeah, agree. Okay. I also have a question on back to the college side of things. If every college kind of gets to choose what they're doing, like I know Notre Dame is going back way early. So in theory, they'd have a season early or, or how does it work when different colleges get to control what they do with their teams? And then how do you go and play at other colleges where rules might be different? So the schedules will be the same. The schedules have not been, you know, revised, at least to my knowledge so far. Uh, Notre Dame's football season will be the same, um, but they're independent, so it's a little bit different story. Um, the, 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 the problem, I guess, the NCAA has, has been very, very quiet about this, and probably with some justification, because again, it's gonna be very much determined by region, um, but the, very, the different schools are taking different approaches based upon uh, the advice they're getting both from infectious diseases experts, from local health uh, officials, and also, of course, you know, from their own risk tolerance. You know, what are they willing to, to, to assume? And so uh, I know, for example, even you know, some of you may recall uh, uh, Chip Zukowski, who was our pro provost here at UB and is now at USC. He and I have been corresponding a lot about this. I know that USC, for example, is telling student athletes that they may come back. They're not required to, that they will honor their scholarship mm -hmm. regardless. Um, and so that's a bit of a different story. Um, I remember reading about three weeks ago, I'd say it was, uh, UT was telling its student athletes to come back. And they interviewed one young man, the football team is like, well, what are you gonna do? It's your job. They tell you to come back, you're gonna come back because you know, the reality of it is if you don't come back, somebody else is gonna take that job. 
um, and then the difference in the college realm, and I'll, I'll probably get a little bit on the soapbox here, is that they're not unionized. They don't have the protection. Oftentimes, they're people who are not from um, particularly sophisticated circumstances, and they are at the beck and call of the coaching staff. And some, some institutions are going to be, you know, more or less, I guess, ethical in their treatment of their student athletes than others. But we've seen that in other, in other circumstances as well, right? Yeah. And then um, Ryan has another question of what are the legal and financial hurdles that the Pegulas are facing in building a new Bill Stadium and how has COVID impacted the project? Oh, that's a great question. So I'm just really glad they didn't get into it before COVID, right? Can you imagine being in the midst of that right now? Um, that facility out there that uh, Stan Kroenke is building in LA that was already double over budget, that's going to be triple over budget. Now, luckily, he's got the money, so no, no, not to worry, right? And quite honestly, doesn't bother me a bit to see that happen to him. Sorry about that, but it doesn't. Um, but yeah, uh, that's going to be a hard sell to New York State, I would imagine, for a while for a while now presumably uh the nfl will take the foot off the pedal in terms of pressuring the to you know to to build another facility um because everybody's gonna be everybody's gonna be retrenching right um but certainly that's going to impact the availability of financing because as i'm sure you're you're, you're probably aware um they'll be looking to new york state for a good chunk of that All righty. Does anybody have any other questions? You can unmute yourself or you can. Who's going to watch the out NHL playoffs? I, I have a question. Who's going to watch the NHL playoffs, even though we're not in it? Oh, it's too painful. It's too I'm painful. watching. But then again, the Rangers are in the playoffs, so I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was going to come. <laughs> so, so does anybody feel. Um, which which of the leagues are you most interested in seeing come back? What do people think? Or start, I should say, for MLB. NFL for me. NFL. Uh, baseball. <laughs> baseball. Okay. Hockey for me. Hockey. UB basketball. UB women's basketball. <laughs> we got the time. Hopefully, right? right? That's our team. That's the Newman Center's team. <laughs> yeah. So now that may be that may be one way where they push it back. There, I've heard some some talk. Uh, I'll use the word scuttle, but my daughters will groan. But um, I, I've heard some some chatter that perhaps we might see um, some flexible scheduling in terms of pushing seasons back. And I've heard that both at the high school and the collegiate level. So we may have women's basketball, but it may not occur until you know after the new year. Is the thought. I can live with, with that. fans or without fans? Oh, now, Jean, that I don't know. And that, <laughs> that's the hard part. That is the hard part. I mean, the good thing about that, though, is I think it would it would spur uh, um, increased tech, use of technology, much like we're seeing in the classroom now. I mean, who knew I could teach on Zoom, right? And and uh, <laughs> uh, I, we're going to see more and more of that. And I think it will, might, we might be seeing more coverage. So maybe we won't see just a few games, of, of, you know, a Bulls uh, basketball and football games on, online. We'll see them all, you know, which would be great. I'd like that. So I guess as we're starting to come to a close, to put you on the spot. Well, thank you so much, everybody. It's good to see your faces. We miss you and now we stay well, okay? Yes. Oh, we yeah. have one more question. Sure. At the college level, it seems like different leagues are taking different approaches. For example, the Ivy League is meeting this week, he believes, at the ACC playoffs. Duke said no way and the league canceled. What are your thoughts? <laughs> well, it's Coach K, what do you expect? Um, yeah, uh, that's interesting. They do, they do take, they do take different, different approaches. Uh, I'm actually waiting, um, Mond we were supposed to find out today what my daughter, my, uh, my daughter Maureen goes to Harvard, she's a rising sophomore. And we were waiting uh, to hear today what the plans were for a return to school um, next year. And instead of that, we got an email saying, please plan to attend a Zoom meeting on Monday where we'll have a panel there to tell you things. So rumor is that they're going to be bringing back um, 1,600 kids, which is about a quarter of the, of the population, 
and um, almost all the graduate schools have gone remote. And so the thought being that they would just spread them out, you know, and, and so the, again, the rumor is that they would bring back seniors and freshmen and student athletes. Um, but I think it's going to vary greatly by sport. Uh, for those of you who may know a little bit about the Olympic sports, uh, the Olympics and the Paralympic organization did put out a list of, you know, sort of of sports by level of exposure, potential exposure, low risk to high risk. Um, and, you know, certain sports obviously are much more concerning than others. Fencing is probably fine, you know, uh, cross country if you stagger the starts, starts, golf, go for it, maybe tennis, um, but something that's not so much. And, um, you know, the, uh, the Ivies in particular seemed to be uh, leaning in the direction of, of observing those, those guidelines. Um, so we'll see. As as for places like Duke and, and you know other other places where you know big revenue sports generates a lot a lot of money, I don't know. And and you know the, the the bigger question for me from the collegiate level in particular is going to be what happens to Title IX, because without the revenues that the that the big sports bring in, um, other programs are going to suffer. And we've already seen that some institutions are cutting teams, but they have to do so and try to do so within the constraints of Title IX, and that's going to be very challenging to do. Well, I guess the only question left is, should we return to play? What do you think? Fans, no fans? Do you think it's worth it? Do you think it's safe? Like NFL season, no fans. Should we still, or is it safe? Do you think we should return? So I, I have um, a couple of family members who are at high risk. And I wince when I walk by a driveway where people are having a big party. Um, I'm going to have a real hard time if there are even 40,000 fannies in New Era Field in September, much as I love the Bills, and I love the Bills, but um, I just don't think that's a good idea, and I think it's kind of denying reality a little bit, right? And as counsel? No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. What do you think about no fans? still playing the game but no fans or is it still there's so many people gathered together is it just a recipe for disaster well that's still you know a minimum of a couple hundred people mm -hmm. and some of them will be able to stay somewhat distant but they're still in you know in interrelated there um i don't know i think the 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 experience in europe will be instructive you know soccer is re re resuming there but again they don't have the problem there right now that we do here that's, I mean, that's the concerning part of it. To me, the, the sort of the most surrealistic piece of all of this is sending players into Orlando right now. That just boggles my mind. And I recognize this was all set up long before that, but that's just, what are you thinking? Um, so I, I guess we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have time to find out. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. That was thank so you interesting. Me. You got Miss plenty everybody. of comments on Facebook saying, great talk. So that was really great, really interesting, fantastic job. We're all so thankful. So who's um, next up? I, I want to see the next one. Who's next up? Well, fa father's not on Zoom, but I'm, I'm looking at you, father. <laughs> <laughs> the, mus the much anticipated, he's gotten out of two years now, he hasn't given a talk. So drum roll. <laughs> out to you, father. You'll get it in like 20 seconds, a little bit delayed, but maybe, maybe we'll finally see the anticipated Monsignor Reverend Father Pat Kelleher talk. So that would be wonderful. <laughs> but yes, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. Like thank you. I said before, I'll make sure that it's available later tonight. It'll be published on our YouTube account, which is UB Newman. And if you also happen to be on Facebook, if you haven't already, follow or like our Facebook page. And since this is also on Facebook Live, you can go back and you can rewatch a Facebook Live. Oh, Father good. Pat said he'll try. So, woo! <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. It was so thank great you. to be able to connect with everyone, you know, even though we're not. Together, we're still together. And as Father would want me to say, be prayerful and be careful. Everyone have a great night. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night, all. Thank Good night. you. Night. Bye. <laughs> Bye.
Bye, everyone.